Welcome friends. Poetry Show 72, that's Gord's Poetry Show, number 72, part 2, continuing right along with uh, that uh, surfeit of uh, fine verse that I uh, dove into yesterday. And um, continuing right along. No question about that, even though it is a sunny day, and during the course of this broadcast, the sun might come right that window and make me uh, brighter than you'd prefer. <clears throat> we'll make adjustments as we move along. Um, the poets and writers are dying all the time. <laughs> Hardly a week goes by when two or three of them don't pop off into eternity with a smile and a wave. Um, so I'm already several months out of date with my little tribute to Robert Hunter, uh, the lyricist for the Grateful Dead and composer of many fine songs. Some of a distinctly poetic hue. Doing a little bit of research after he passed, I discovered that he was not fond of uh, exculpating, <laughs> explicating his verse to interviewers. And um, I say cheers for that, Robert. Who needs an explanation? Dark Star Crashes pouring its light into ashes. Reason tatters, the forces tear loose from the axis. Searchlight casting for faults in the clouds of delusion. Shall we go then, you and I, while we can, through the transitive nightfall of diamonds? Mirror shatters, in formless reflections of matter, glass hand dissolving to ice petal flowers revolving. Lady in velvet recedes in the nights of goodbye. Shall we go then, you and I, while we can, through the transitive nightfall of diamonds? Spinning a set, the stars through which the tattered tales of Axis roll about the waxen wind of never set to motion in the unbecoming round about the reason hardly matters nor wise through which the stars were set in spin. Hmm. Stella Blue. All the years combine, they melt into a dream. A broken angel sings from a guitar. In the end, there's just a song, comes crying like the wind through all the broken dreams and vanished years. Stella Blue. When all the cards are down, there's nothing left to see. There's just the pavement left and broken dreams. In the end, there's still that song comes crying like the wind down every lonely street that's ever been. Stella Blue. I've stayed in every blue light cheap hotel, can't win for trying, dust off those rusty strings just one more time, gonna make them shine. It all rolls into one, and nothing comes for free. There's nothing you can hold for very long. And when you hear that song come crying like the wind, it seems like all this life was just a dream. Stella Blue.
Thank you, Robert Hunter, for many hours of mystified listening. Um, what's next? Oh, I've got it here somewhere. Oh. oh, I must have put it down someplace else. But we'll get back to it in a minute. The next thing. The next thing is actually going to be the next other thing. Sharon Olds. We were dipping into Sharon Olds' arias. And uh, we're going to dip some more. This is a sizable book of my dad. Hundred and... 190 pages of poetry. That's larger than usual. Mortal Aria for Carl. I don't feel that I'm slowly dying, though I am. Many cells inside my ears in the ossicle and malleus and cochlea have died where they lived and worked. I don't know if they're there, still, looking like themselves, but dead, or if their corpses wore away, broke down to their elements, and were shuffled off by cap <laughs> capillaries. I don't know if I peed them out, and now they're in an ocean bay or trench, or if I breathed them out, I might breathe one in again. And maybe a third of the nerves in the soles of my feet died slowly as the bones of my lumbar backbone collapsed onto each other over time, flattening the spinal cord. Years ago, when the cancer had spread in my lover's body, it appeared on the x-ray as areas of darkness in his clavicle and hip and skull. When the doctor showed us the x-ray, I moved close to my love, so my left arm lay against his right arm that he not be without touch, seeing that invader. Car, car, hard, hard. It was not an animal or a vegetable, but alive. It lives in him still, and they are nuking it, which is giving him some time. When the cancer kills him, I don't know if it will outlive him by an hour or a day before it dies. If it were not a stupid wish, I would wish the dead cancer could be taken out of his body before he is dressed in a linen shroud, that I could dress him in it. We will sit with him, we will sing to him, he will be put to bed in the earth he loves. I think of him at four years old, in the little three-puce suit and cap. His parents dressed him in, and his brother also in. A look of amazement, wonder, almost bafflement on his beautiful face. On and off, on and off. All his life he has emitted light. I would watch him sleep in the dark woods, his brow reflecting starlight. Well, we all know that one. Morning Aria, 6,000 feet. First I clean the hotel room hot plate so I will not smell any burnt once living matter, washing the metal and checking the paper towel. As when, after I shit, I wipe and look to see if it's clean, that almost unknown floral knob back down there in prehistory. Then I untangle the machine's cord, which is bent, flattened, crinkled, crushed like my spinal cord on the x-ray, silver snake caught between the boulders of a collapsing stone wall. The coffee filling the pot looks beautiful this morning, made from mountain water. Then I realize I had forgotten to put any ground beans in and I start over. I am starting over. I am laying down my ambition to disguise that I am a creature of Narcissus, as if a daughter of Narcissus could be anything but a Narcissus. I am not seeking a man to love and be loved by, though of course I always am. I am seeking to learn to like this large awkward being, flightless dragon damsel fly. Fashion thyself, then others shall thee bear. To pull up my vanity out of the backyard dirt, where I buried it when I saw it could not go forth 
alive from that house yesterday morning. I woke in an aquarium of heavy monoxide sea level bay air. This morning I woke in an area with very little oxygen in it, and I am so old now. Dear old one, I could learn to care for you. I like the worn scar of your first titanium hip, barely visible by now on the choppy sea of your posterior. I even like the fresh anterior scar across your inguinal fold, completing a fierce X. I said I was tired of loving my mother and father. I was so vain about being able to love them. Who says I love them? If I loved them, I could love myself. Well, there's a revelation. Gary Barwin. Yes, more Gary Barwin. I know you've been waiting for this one. Um, boy, what a tough choice. There's so much good stuff in this book. This uh, selected poems for It is a pleasure and a surprise to breathe. Um, I did make a choice. Or the choice made me. Street sign. Mike Harris made me eat my dog. He made me eat telephone poles. He made me eat a map of Moscow. He was there while I was waiting at a bus stop. I was about to talk to him to walk right up and enter into a discussion about the governing of Ontario, but then the bus came. And I opened my mouth and a bus drove right in. It was full of little people, told by the yellow signs to move to the back. Yes, further, please, still further. Thank you, the sign said. And a young man who himself had just opened his mouth to a bus began to feel the people moving back beyond his molars, back to where he had a trouble flossing. And a few slipped on his wet tongue. And it was like Disney on ice, except there was no Goofy, and they made frantic calls to their lawyers. And then suddenly Goofy appeared, sporting a fedora, and his nose, suddenly his nose was Ecuador, and I could see the imaginary line of the equator arcing across the sky. And older sailors found inexperienced sailors and played tricks on them, read them poetry but left out the rhymes. And they all climbed up the outside of an office building, and it was up to me to make the eulogy. And I began with a deck of cards, and I made a man out of chewing gum, and I stretched his minty arms around the legislature, and the bit that got caught in my hair I had to cut off. And while my fellow workers discussed the need for a small woolen hat, some of us rolled up our trousers and went swimming in the hat. And I discovered a handle sticking out of my left side. And I began to lift myself while singing, I'm a little teapot, realizing that I was probably more than a little teapot. And then a river began to flow from the right hand that was my spout. And soon I was subject to erosion and seasonal flooding. And I began to wish that instead I was an estuary. And it was time for the six ducks to wibble wobble onto some wallpaper in a child's room. The child's mother comes up the stairs just back from her job as a street sign. And she says, stop! Jeez, that was good, eh? Excellent, Gary. And um, we're moving right along to something he calls the Slurpee Paradigm. And uh, I'm sure this is going to be a serious philosophical treatise. The Slurpee Paradigm. Sometime after midnight at the Okie Dokie School of Philosophy, Happy the philosopher's dog feels the end of his life trudging towards him while the philosophers drain the last of their espressos and continue to talk philosophy. It would make our lives easier, Joy Slack says, if he we were sl slurpy dispensers. <laughs> Happy Jacket flicks something he can't identify from his tweed. You mean the actual dispensing machines, he asks? Or the ones entrusted with slurpy dispensing? Beneath the table, Happy shifts. Dog mortality, like a year in the life of a dog, is seven times more intense. His thoughts collect in one of those thought balloons used to notate the minds of dogs. And it is usually sloppier without the benefit of one's own species gathered by the death basket. Happy entertains the possibility of gnawing on Joy Slack's scuffed brown shoe. Consider what else in this life is cold, colourful and slushy. I mean, besides married life. Ha ha ha. 
Joy Slack's laugh is a rocking chair on a primeval porch. The Slurpy Paradigm is what I shall call my new book. Happy Jacket flicks something else he can't identify from his tweed. A perfect follow-up to the slushy truth, I'd say. Another thought balloon forms above the head of the philosopher's dog. There are more joints in the bones of dogs, ergo more places for the bones of dogs to ache, it says. Ah, yes. Civilization for Carmel Perkis. We use our mouths to carry birds. We so often carry pitchforks. History is holes to fill. We so often carry birds. Our heads are marble busts in a museum. We hardly remember the missing limbs. We so often use the wind for a mouth. What is missing is also pitchforks. The mouth. Birds made of pitchforks. A museum for farmers. Look through the mouth at the haystack of birds filled with holes we think of as flying. We use our mouths to carry birds. We could carry pitchforks or kings. We spit birds out like the history of birds. Here. A ticket to the museum. Well, well, more Gary Barwin. And um, onward he goes, as productive as ever, as ever the last 20 years, <laughs> or more perhaps. And what have I got here? Oh yes, that one. All oh, right. Um, Julia, no, sorry, Julie Cameron Gray and her book, Lady Crawford. It's an interesting cover. It's uh, the gold leaf print and the cover. Um, palimpsestpress.ca uh, Small press I'm taking ever more notice of these days. Um, I think there's some um, two sections to the book. There's the Lady Crawford section. And I think prior to that, oh yes, last to leave the party. There's a couple of nifty ones in that section. Skin birds. That's birds with a Y, by the way. Tattooed by friends, the spittle of Hastings in spring. My life, not so much, much so far, but a hard look setting my face to read working class pride. My hands stuffed in pockets or flicking some endless cigarette. I'm with the other girls, feather cut and sloping our spines against the brick, all trucked up in heavy eyeliner and bright lips. We're young enough to still be lovely things, no matter how hard the old siren screams, it's paddy wagon song. So why are we standing around, waiting for the boys to be interesting? Look at them, shoving each other against cement for fun and games, ladding down a back alley, wild as red fur, fussing, a foxing about, hell-bent on a trick of the light and a five-fingered discount. And that one, scrap of silk in his pocket. Half rude boy, halfway handsome, all jumped up, not trying too hard. He's going to come over now and start blagging on about things we all know. Like coppers can't be trusted and parents are a joke. We know why we're here. We're waiting for our moment to come. The chance to throw our arms around the sun, the mace of our days. And hunt down the good time that we're owed. Uh, an excellent portrayal there, Julie. I sort of remember those days, you know, about 50 years ago for me. Um, after dark at the Tate Britain. Ghostly, this torso in metal. Cold dark matter explodes inwards. 
a coterie of dismembered carpentry, post-tornado story of limbs, flashlight bobbing about dark causeways, sculpture after sculpture navigated with echolocation. The Impressionists leave none like this. Monet's water lilies dilute in the dark. A beam across them yields no depth. They live only in bright rooms, light blue air. Better to comb through the many beards of Blake. The brimstone a high contrast sort of bleak. This is the hour of traces where your ear picks up everything your battery-operated eye does not. That banging you hear has been interpreted as a beating heart or a clock's pendulum. If you knew the way out, you'd take it. The Lady Crawford section, all centered on the one character. Have fun storming the castle. The house knows it needs a moat, but there's none to be found. The boxwood shrubs decorate when they need to protect. The front door is glossy, but repels nothing but rain. The local hockey team patrols an indoor ice rink, dreams of winning. The others, they have dreams of better lives that don't exist. Their lives are the better ones, where they can yearn and reach. Things don't give us anything but order, a single-use tool. The single-use tools all need a place, lest they overrun us with their thingness. The right kitchen tile will bring you inner peace. The new quest for meaning yielded moisture moisture wicking technology. The secular world is falling short, lacks the shine we know and love. The stoicism of our worldview is no match for the enthusiasm for change. The ones without, they hear birdsong of lit up things and come for you. They march on your home and terrify the boxwoods, rend the glossy door. The violence will be unfair, but measured. They need it. Flowers rip to pieces and the smash of glass singing. Bloodshed is variable, depending on how prepared you are. The limits of things will be expanded, dispersed like atoms. The disbursement will leave your family cowering in a safe room. The enthusiasm will save some lives, but not yours. The Sermon from the Lexus. Indeed, this traffic in which we're all corralled is exhausting. Pulsing turning signal, save me from the hoi polloi, here and on my way back home. Let the people have pulp novels and McDonald's, mass market everything. Give me this day my GPS coordinates, e-cigarettes, takeout meals and internet porn, and deliver me from myself as we deliver others with compliments and coffee. I'll forgive myself this dalliance, the harsh bite at my daughter with arguments against bedtimes, as all the magazines say I should. After all, I'm only one woman. Lead me not into the idea that I could do better, for truly I can not. For mine is the kingdom of yoga's mountain pose, retinol creams that keep me looking ten years younger, the crossfit and detox salads that keep me trim forever and ever. Amen. On Origins You weren't born into nobility. One room basement apartment, single mother, public schools and spaghetti dinners. Dresses hand-sewn at a time when store-bought was in the fashion. Years before, your plainness gave way to fine bones, learned artistry. You went on to live many places, each a rope you wove yourself. 
It was decades before you came to learn your fingerprint is your address. That property value is inversely proportional to how real home feels. <clears throat> Lady Crawford herself. Lady Crawford. You believe in single malt, sweetening the worst of it. You love the smoothness of that lacquered wood, the smell of my perfume, linden and laurel, as though I were a patch of grass and flowers in which to bury your hands, the zippered length of my back. Because I am a thing, am I not? A terrarium, a ring, a gold coin? And you, can you see your own thingness? Button-down shirt, haircut, a driverless car, sonic down the highway. Sometimes when we kiss, the highway shifts its lanes so we can make our exit. A near miss that leaves hands pressed to the wheel's centre. Trumpets sounding all around us. Um, I believe in single malt, sweetening the worst of it, uh, Julie. Um, I hope that uh, doesn't spoil the uh, vision for you. I'm, I'm moving to get something that I left over here somewhere. Yes, more Mark Laba. I left it over by the rocking chair. <coughs> the inflatable life, as we noted yesterday. Just how inflatable is it? Can, I get, can we get to be the size of clouds? I sure hope so. Well, this is a sequence he calls the Wallace Stevens Hit Parade. And you can imagine there'll be references here. Yes, there'll be references. Be warned. Part one is called Gutter Ball of Bathsheba. Gutter Ball screamed the parakeet. How often its disgusting little feet gripped the glint of morning's false light, heroics left to the shadows of naked dwarfs bulging with the rocking of ramshackle clouds after the railroad train pulls out of Peking and the creamery shutters bang in the piebald heat. I have to have a sip after that. Um, uh, yes. The Bananas of Dr. Horst. Back at the Waldorf, the world hummed in his handkerchief. Naked tragedy clawing at the tunky, tunky, tunky. Planks of bananas, masculine and feminine, crowded like poodles under parasols. Oh, mother, do not enter the foliage where paratroopers with unhealthy appetites bear barren fruit of bleak illusion, and an old man on a mountain is only the remnant anatomy of tragic puppet spray. Plinky, plinky, plonk, piano keys of loquacious salad beds, Never were the sounds so unsmelled than in the labial gardens of Dr. Horst and his bananas, the arches of Minneapolis fallen in the savage debris of disillusionment. Oh, bitter. Oh. Four ways of looking at an alligator. Usually people say 13 ways. That's a nice change. We're down to four ways now. <clears throat> One, a man, a woman, and an alligator wear sagging pantaloons and smell of summer fields, skeletons and meat gravy, their shadows traced by blotchy blackbirds with grim hallucination. Two, I was of three minds, the alligator, the blackbird, and a discarded mouth organ left on the shore of a blobby sea, dark marine with the hems of beggars' capes, happy fecundity your phantom glass blowers of North America. Three. Yowza, yowza, yowza. 
O thin tailors of Vesuvius, your warbling is the blindness of ground beef, the inescapable rhythm of newspapers driven by the coughing that brings poetry to the pineapples of artifice. Four. Is that an alligator in your pants, or do you just want to wrestle me under the sassafras tree, greased with the jelly of a perplexed machine? The alligator rests, but the blackbird is weary, taciturn. A paper mache ventriloquist, dead on a sofa near Lake Geneva, knows this and remains bitter as a dried leaf pressed between the pages of a nudie book, begetting tubas and purple prunes of engorgement. Well, well, well. Wasn't that a... Uh, oh my goodness, there's another part. The Emperor of Ice Cream. I should have known there'd be more. Roll out the barrel and yelp. Hap, hap, hello. For the wench is but a cataleptic, polymathic, hierophant vassal born of Mrs. Papadopoulos. We all scream ice cream with gawky beaks as the emperor rubs himself with weak facts and an old fan touche, lacking a personalia and a dog-eared vocabulary. It's just booming vulgarity in vanilla or chocolate, so don't even ask for coconut, you lewd opiate of chastity and musty teeth. Affix your fuzzy wig to your knobby, swollen head and inhale the odors of the fantails of Oklahoma. Then ask yourself with trembling lip and palaver of hand, what do you want? A rifle butt or a sugar cone? Beep, beep. Don't touch my bumper of doom, you concupiscent curd of a human, for I am the emperor of the ice cream truck. And no, I do not have any pistachio. <laughs> Mark Laba. Laughing all the way to the bank, no doubt. And uh, more power to him. Keep it up. Um, we're getting down to, what are we getting down to? Oh, yes. Came across this book by a South Korean poet uh, whose name is Kim Hai Soon. And the book is called Autobiography of Death. And of course, it's translated. Um, published by New Directions, which is, you know, you don't see often New Directions books these days. Translated from the Korean by Don Mi Choi. And um, it uh, follows the Buddhist mythology of 49 days between death and a new birth, which I completely disagree with. And um, Buddhist mythology is about as uh, creative as uh, Christian mythology. It's got nothing to do with actual, what actually happens. But, you know, um, people do cleave to religious belief systems. Anyway, the poetry is quite good. Oh, sorry, the translations are quite good. But I did want to read a little snippet of um, um, each of the 49 poems in Autobiography of Death represents one of the 49 days during which the spirit roams about after death before it enters the cycle of reincarnation. Well, for some maybe, but not for everybody. There's a lot you can do after you die. You don't have to follow any religious paradigm. Um, but, you know, that's just me bitching. The poetry's still pretty good. Um, there's an, um, an interview um, with the translator and her done December 5, 2017. How did you come to write the poems in this book? And Kim Hai Soon says, In April of 2014, a ferry carrying passengers and high school students going on a field trip to an island capsized. All of us, the whole country, couldn't take our eyes off the screen on TV of the slowly sinking ferry. The children had their life jackets on, so if they had been told to leave the boat, they could have survived. But instead, the crew instructed them to stay in their cabins and then escape themselves. The police that came to the rescue were helpless, and the government didn't do a thing and never investigated the tragedy. I teach at a college near the children's school, for a whole year, I didn't wear any clothes with bright colors. Going to work every day was like going to a funeral. 
Besides this ferry incident, there have been many other incidents in our country where people have lost their lives under the violent force of government. While resisting injustice, many have died on a massive scale, and many have also died because they have been unjustly accused. So whenever such unbearable events occurred, I wrote these poems. Much more, of course. And we're so accustomed to hearing about the dire straits of the population of North Korea, and we tend to think of South Korea as this, uh, you know, busy capitalist metropolis where everyone's, you know, working away and doing not too badly. Um, and I guess that's naivety. Um, so I just wanted to draw your attention to this. And um, I'll read one of the poems. Day 32, A Lie. Press the button and it's winter. No one can set up house in winter. It's unbelievably quiet. It's unbelievably clean. From the sky above, the shattered window glass glitters like gems. Imagine all the idle buses without tires at the station. The stars die, the moon dies. White chickens faint on top of snow. Chicken coops collapse. Imagine a city where no one wakes up even when morning arrives. All you have to do is press the button. It's easier than poking embroidery with a needle. Not a moment to let out a scream. You can throw away yesterday's bus ticket. You don't have to carry the old sack on your back. No more farewells. Bid farewell to farewells. Only the white ash soars. Just press the button and there's a fallen tree on top of a fallen person. The fallen wind on top of the fallen tears. The fallen water overflows on top of the fallen building. Press the button and your filthy secrets are buried forever like the breath of the dead. It's totally fair. Don't laugh when you get there. The loneliness of a loner now vanishes. That's why the lonely ending presses the button. The loneliest ending in the world. How incredibly fortunate. So hurry, press the button, said mister. Death is the only lie in the world. Crow's feathers are pink. Even the river is pink. Well, that's certainly uh, bundled up with energy, isn't it? Autobiography of a death. New Directions. Kim Hai Soon. Where did I find it? Well, it came into the library. Um, where are we? I wanted to do um, another Lawrence Ferlinghetti when I look at pictures. Nifty here. I showed you the picture of this famous uh, The Luncheon of the Boating Party by a Renoir. Opposite that, he writes, Late Impressionist Dream. In a late Impressionist dream, I am riding in an open touring car with a group of French women in summer dresses and picture hats with uncles in grey doe-skin vests and striped shirts with armbands and everyone is laughing and chattering in French as if no other language had yet become socially accepted. And we get to an outdoor cafe by the Seine on the outskirts of Paris, as in a Manet painting under an arbor by the river, drinking wine and eating a grand picnic out of wicker hampers. And at the next table, a group of French intellectuals are indulging in their famous grand logique, proving that such and such is really an oxymoron. And just then, some loud young men drift by in punts on the river, looking sheepishly like young American college students singing a drinking song about whiff and poofs, and we go on talking in French as if nothing else in the real world were happening anywhere. And all the people around me turn into characters out of Marcel Proust, and we're all in Swan's Way, in a budding grove, with a straight Odette chase one. But then... Of a sudden, Blaise Sondrage bursts in, waving a newspaper headline, screaming, Lord, Lord, and gold has been discovered in California, and I must leave immediately to join the gold rush and wake up in my cabin in Big Sur looking like a French Canuck Jack Kerouac and hearing the sound of the sea in which the fish still speak Breton. <laughs> Great. I love it. Um... Yeah, so we're going to fit, uh, well, we've got a couple of minutes left. 
Um, what was I going to do? Do I think it was a poem by Anne Compton from her book Alongside, which we'll get into later. She won the Governor General's at some point. And uh, that's now here. Oh, all praise to those who can win prizes. But what's important to me is that she's a good poet. And here's a little one from Alongside Anne Compton. Kind of a nifty cover. And um, The Tree in Winter. The tree in winter is near to pure form. Sonnet without content, gazal and grey. Sap sunk to root, fibrous root thirsting its way to water table. While bare limbs conform to loss, no conduction can be inferred. Still, there's an underground to everything. The way your absence even now is moving in some element in unamenable to word or syntax. If lingual, let it be what stones here. I don't want to know if you recant or why. The beauty you lifted vein by vein through me, knowing only I'll not be that again. Thanks, Anne. That was a good one. Now, there's a local poet around here called Gordon Finn, and he's just published a book called The Poet Stewart, which is... Um, a bunch of homages to uh, Canadian poet Stuart Ross accumulated over the years between oh, 2004 and 2019. And um, I don't know, I, I like all of them, but here's a good one called Preference. Whew, it's a busy, noisy Tim's here in Canada land. Yet my headphones make it easy to hear the poet Stuart read three of his Razovsky lyrics while sitting in, a, in his car at peace on a rainy day by the lake, his image so close I might as well be opposite, measured in feet, not miles. Such is the intimacy of the internet, a worldwide web to wrap us in the bruises of the world's brutalities. When he completes his reading, I rejoice in print and then prime myself with music discovered the day before that yet tickles my fancy. Julie Driscoll and the Brian Auger Trinity in Concert. Berlin 68. With a tablet one can wander, and I do, my aging bladder begging for relief. So right there in the washroom I sit, still enraptured with the concert and the artists I once saw, here in Toronto, summer 69 at the fabled rock pile on Young. Life is like that these days, connections back and forth through time and space, while seated sipping coffee, concerned about one world, and how to share it with those who would slaughter in a second, to share it only with their preference. Yes, the poet Stuart. May he flourish eternally. We have a couple of minutes left. Maybe I should whip in a short one. Let's see. A cure for desire. Youth. I was in a hurry, but why was I in a hurry? Maturity. Lunch settles and the sun comes out. Age. Behind the clouds there is only sky. Blue or pinpricked black. Death. The bath water's cold, but I don't care. I'm a tree without leaves taking root elsewhere. Beyond before. With my ghosts redundant, I doubled as God and disappeared. Rebirth. Itching to row a flashy boat, I bait myself with womb food and cast. Family. To utter and gurgle, to suck and see. Let understanding come to others. Indeed, let understanding come to others, and uh, you in particular. So we're running out of time, as we always do, as we slide into eternity. And I bid you all farewell and um, hmm. many blessings for 2020. Much wonderful poetry and much wonderful time to read it in. So long. <laughs>